All right, so it's just after 10 o'clock and our top story at the Sawa, a group of 10 South Africans evacuated from conflict-torn Sudan have been reunited with their families following their arrival earlier this evening. Now, these were part of over 600 people who moved from Sudan to Saudi Arabia and then to their respective countries following a 72-hour extension of the ceasefire agreement by the Sudanese Army and the Rapid Support Force. Some South Africans evacuated from the war-torn Sudan say they are lucky to come back home alive. The Department of International Relations and Cooperation says that all South Africans who were stuck in conflict-torn Sudan have been safely evacuated. According to aid organization Gift of the Givers, those evacuated included eight South Africans, an American man and his daughter, who is also South African. The Sudanese army has urged people in the capital Khartoum to remain indoors, stay away from windows as it deploys tanks and other artillery in spite of the ceasefire declared. Veli Mbele Kazombisi is an essayist, co-founder of Mutapa, a think tank that focuses on dialogue and teaching of authentic history. He breaks down to us some of the reasons that he believes led to the ter deterioration of peace in Sudan. Uh, Veli joins us now via Zoom for more. A very good evening to you, Veli. Thanks for your time here on the ACBC. Hi, Lizel. Uh, always a pleasure. So I'm excited for the context and the history lesson to unfold because I think it's just important to, to establish the lens through which we're going to have this conversation. Caution against it being too Eurocentric. Perhaps we could speak about, you know, the formation of Sudan, the land and her people. Um, I know that it's one of the largest countries in the in, in our, It is the largest or if not one of the largest countries in Africa, perhaps ninth in the world. It's not been caught up in the geopolitics. Uh, dynamics that are unfolding. I also understand that there is pan-Arabism versus pan-African ideologies that pervade that region. Perhaps you could talk to us about that. Thanks, Liesl. I mean, you've, you've laid it down uh, quite beautifully, right? And uh, so the point of departure is to state that um, Sudan is arguably one of the most important countries uh, in terms of our splendid uh, pre-colonial African civilizations. I mean, just one of the interesting facts about Sudan, you know, when people always talk about the pyramids uh, on our continent and they refer to Egypt, as a matter of fact, uh, most of the pyramids are actually in Sudan. Over 200 of the pyramids are in Sudan. So just from the perspective of um, pre-colonial African history, Sudan is particularly important, and one of its original names is actually Nubia, which means a land of black people, and it straddles parts of Egypt, uh, parts of um, Ethiopia, right? And so it was a huge country. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Sudan is also a country that's particularly rich with gold, and um, because of that, and its geopolitical position, like you said, access to the Red Sea, uh, and the area around the Red Sea, having countries like Chad and Djibouti, Egypt to the north, and Ethiopia, you know, and the Nile also access to the Nile makes it quite an important uh, country in terms of its strategic location. But Sudan also has a very unfortunate history that since its uh, declaration of independence from uh, a joint uh, colonial arrangement between Egypt and Britain, in 1957, 58, around about then, Sudan has had no less than about 12 coups, right, since 1957, 1958. And it has been uh, staggering from one coup to the other. And central to all of these coups that have been happening in Sudan has been the contest for strategic control of Sudan and Sudan's resources. And the latest, um, coup that we have under the two generals, uh, Dagado and uh, Burhan, you know, is an extension of that unfortunate history of the Sudan. Where do you speak about uh, its history and uh, the, you know, the government since the formation back in 1956, um, after being a colony of the British Empire, the 12 coups um, to date, perhaps you could speak to the effects of the war that uh, it's had on the displacement of people, on the deaths as we assess, um, you know, where to from here um, during the ceasefire. Yes, and it's important for us, Liesl, to not just start with the unfortunate situation, of course, you know, 
uh, over almost about 500 people, especially civilians, having died now in the recent conflict between the two generals and people being displaced. But it's also important to state that people have been dying and people have been massacred in Sudan for decades, right? Remember, Sudan is one of the countries that has one of Africa's longest civil war, right? It had what was called the first Sudan civil war and the second Sudan civil war. So it is not a recent phenomenon. And it is important that we understand that this is a tragedy that has been unfolding for decades. Now, like you correctly talk, there has been displacement. And the displacement obviously affects neighboring countries, you know, like Ethiopia, like Chad, like Egypt. But what has also been happening is that these countries themselves have had conflicts and there has been a flow of arms in the region between uh, these countries. But equally disturbing has been the problem of mercenary groups in that part of the world, right? And this speaks to the role of foreign interests, right? A number of countries, China, the United Arab Emirates, Israel, um, have interest, the United States, even Russia have got interest there. And what you are seeing happening is a confluence of all those interests at the expense of the ordinary people of Sudan. And the resolution, in my view, is that what needs to happen is that uh, progressive and legitimate and credible countries have to assist Sudan to return to civilian rule because both of the military generals that are at war, you know, are actually part of the problem because they are actually proxies of foreign interests. So the immediate thing here is for us to have a situation where both African uh, bodies and other global bodies, if they could assist, to get Sudan back to civilian rule. Because for a long time, Sudan has been under the kleptocratic rule of military juntas. Remember, Sudan is the country that has been ruled for by 30 years by um, military kleptocrats like Omar al-Bashir. So for me, that is really the critical thing here, to get Sudan back to um, civilian rule. Vedis, thank you very much for breaking that down. Early on, you spoke about minerals and resources. Um, you spoke about it having arable land, gold, and black gold as well. And I wonder if you could help us understand why Sudan's conflict matters to the rest of the world, to the rest of Africa. Um, we're obviously seeing, you know, how this fighting has the potential, if not already, having spilled over into neighboring countries like Egypt and, and Chad, and what that could also mean for, for their economies, for that region, the stability thereof. Yes, so uh, because of where Sudan is located, right, along the Nile Valley. So Sudan is one of those countries that um, has contributed to the Nile Valley civilization, like I said, the beautiful Nubian civilization. But also the Nile Valley and the Red Sea also provide uh, a lot of uh, this thing, commercial activities for those countries that are along the Red Sea and the Nile Valley. And actually, from the Nile Valley to the Red Sea, it gives them access to the Gulf and to Europe and also to the Middle East. So if there is conflict like there is conflict there now, it does affect trade um, within Sudan, but also between Sudan and Egypt, between Sudan and Ethiopia, and between Sudan and Chad and all the other neighboring countries. So it does affect that region because Sudan is borders all of those countries, and therefore it is critical that there should be peace and stability for trade to happen. But like I'm saying, Sudan is being deliberately destabilized because if you just do a, an assessment, the region where Sudan is, is the region that actually has the most foreign military bases, right? Over 13 countries, foreign countries have got military bases in the area where Sudan is. And the reason for that is that many of the foreign countries want to capture that geographic location, right? For the purpose of controlling trade, but also for the purpose to giving them access to the natural resources of countries like Sudan and some of the other African countries. So it is important for that part of Africa that there be peace um, in Sudan, because otherwise all of those neighboring economies are going to collapse or they are going to suffer as it is already happening now. So it is extremely important, both 
in terms of uh, political stability in the region, but also economic stability and the livelihoods of our people in that region. So Sudan is extremely important. Very, we obviously monitoring developments to see how quickly, you know, a solution can be found, perhaps peace restored security to that uh, country and the region at large. Thank you for your time here again on the SABC. Uh, Aveli Mbele Gazon PC is an essayist, co-founder of Mutapa, a think tank focusing on dialogue and teaching of authentic African stories. Um, he was just uh, under helping us understand the history behind the Sudan conflict to date as that ceasefire uh, is, is obviously up. We'll see how far uh, it holds as we find an eminent solution for the civilians, perhaps also the region at large. Again, thank you to Veli for his time.